a little Q and A box in the on the bottom of your screen, and if you type a question there, I'll be able to see it. So um, I think I'm just gonna. Can you still see my video? I'm gonna stop my video here. How's that work? Your video is off. Perfect. Excellent. Okay. So um, yes, I'm Heather Braun and I'm a habitat biologist with the Canadian Wildlife Service. And I wanted to share with you some information about our management of non-native Phragmites uh, in this, uh, the Long Point Biosphere Reserve, which is also an area um, that the Canadian Wildlife Service has designated as a priority place for conservation. So to start off, I wanted to uh, I'll give you a little bit of an overview on what Phragmites is, uh, what its impacts are, the use of best management practices for management of Phragmites. Then I'll talk a little bit about the Long Point program, the purpose and approach for the management that we're doing, ecological monitoring, the outputs and outcomes of this work, and then some of the lessons learned. So Phragmites, I'm sure most of you on the call are familiar with this, um, but Phragmites is a, an introduced plant species. It was dubbed by um, Ag Canada in 2005 as Canada's worst invasive plant species. And um, that is now 16 years ago. So uh, it's been on our radar for quite a while. It's a perennial grass. And we have found it growing up to six meters tall um, on the coast of Lake Erie and uh, in densities of up to 200 stems per meter squared. So it is a, it is a literal wall in some cases of vegetation. It spreads very well by its rhizomes, stolons, stems, and seeds. And it outcompetes native vegetation, particularly in wetlands. As a result, there is a loss of biodiversity and habitat for wildlife. Uh, for Canadian Wildlife Service, that's notably for species at risk. Um, but it also has negative impacts for agriculture and drainage. You'll see it in drainage ditches and along roadsides. Um, it has been known to grow through asphalt. So um, there is a a safety issue along roadsides. There's also a cost issue for maintenance of Phragmites as it grows in roadside areas. Um, there's also a reduction in property values. If you have a, a property on the lake and you can't see the lake because you have a wall of Phragmites um, that detracts from the value of your, your, your cottage. And in certain areas, there have been declines in tourism because those recreational opportunities are impacted by Phragmites. I just wanted to showcase a couple of the photos here. The one on the, the left is, uh, is a piece of Phragmites um, demonstrating how it grows. Uh, under the water, there will be a new shoot about uh, every several inches. And so if that uh, root is broken, uh, you get a whole new series of plants growing. Uh, the picture in the middle shows the very dense below ground biomass. Uh, despite the fact that the plant is six meters tall, about 80% of its biomass is actually underground. And um, you can imagine um, if you thought that you might could just dig up some of the Phragmites, um, you're going to end up um, in certain areas, you'll end up just damaging the plant angering it, as I like to say, um, and um, spawning regrowth of that plant. Uh, the third is, uh, is one of our contractors from Long Point. He is about six feet tall and you'll see him standing in a very dense stand of Phragmites. And um, you'll understand that a lot of um, equipment that we would normally use to drive through wetlands or, or drive through uh, coastal areas like four wheelers, um, they just will not work in areas with Phragmites this dense and tall. 
Um, it's important to note that there is a native uh, species of Phragmites in, uh, in Canada. It's not always easy to determine the native species from the invasive, particularly when invasives are just establishing in an area. So this is something to be very aware of if you're considering implementing a frag management program. Um, and it is best to talk to experts. There, there are a variety of tools available, uh, visual keys to help you determine whether a frag is native or not. Um, but it is sometimes just often hard to follow um, and not always accurate to compare colors and that sort of thing. But um, if you look at the photo on the left, you will see invasive Phragmites is taller and sort of more robust and dense, whereas the native on the right of the image is um, of the landscape image that's native frag and it's notably shorter and it does just grow less dense. And the if inflorescence picture, you can just see how the native differs from the invasive. Stem density uh, or the, the, the width of the stem is uh, of, of also a particular note. So Phragmites has been in Canada for quite a while um, and it is spread not only throughout Ontario, but also across the country. Here are a few images um, from 1990 when you can see Frag was mostly focused on the eastern part of the country, eastern part of the Great Lakes, and in southern Ontario. And by 2010, we had uh, spread up to around the Georgian Bay Sudbury area and uh, a couple spots farther west. And then the image at the bottom is the predicted spread of Phragmites by 2030. <clears throat> now this is from um, a bit of a dated article um, published in 2011, but I do believe we are seeing some of this and um, particularly for Ontario, it is good to note, <laughs> good to be prepared for, um, for the spread of Phragmites that, that will and can occur across the province. Um, as I mentioned, for the Canadian Wildlife Service and for a lot of our partners, one of the primary reasons that we're interested in managing Phragmites is because of its impacts to species at risk. I mentioned that Phragmites outcompetes native vegetation and it, it functionally changes the habitat. It makes the habitat drier. It provides fewer places for animals to breed and to seek shelter. Um, the, the lack of diversity impacts the availability of food and nesting resources, such that there are 25% of Ontario species at risk threatened by Phragmites, and 14 species of species at risk specifically list Phragmites management as a recovery action in their recovery documents. And so, that for Canadian Wildlife Service gives us the impetus to, to tackle the challenge of Phragmites so that we can restore habitat necessary for these sensitive species. Um, there is good news. Uh, I wanted to kind of lead off with that at some of the, at the early part of the presentation. Um, Phragmites can be managed successfully. So we know that there are lots of different ways to, to manage Phragmites. There are lots of ways to not manage Phragmites. And I do want to touch on those. Um, the choice of best management practice will depend on a variety of situations. It depends on the, the scale of the infestation in your area. It depends on your organizations or your individual's capacity to, to launch and maintain a frag management uh, effort. Um, it also depends on your objectives. So whether you're managing for uh, recovery of 
wetland habitat or shoreline habitat, or your objective is to um, improve recreational opportunities, um, there, there will just be some different choices for um, the management practice that you select. The other couple of good news pieces that have just happened within the last year or uh, one within the last uh, month or so is that there is now a biocontrol agent approved for Phragmites. It is, it's, a, it's a stem boring moth. And if you'll recall, um, the beetle that was released uh, for Frag, uh, I'm sorry, for Purple Loosestrife several years ago um, was um, developed and evaluated and assessed by Dr. Bern Blossy at Cornell University. And he has now been working for 20 years on a biocontrol agent, which is a, a stem boring moth native to Europe, where our, our invasive plant is also native. And this is now in the hands of uh, Ag Canada, and they and the University of Toronto are working on test releases. So this is, um, this agent is not really available for public consumption yet, but um, we hope that our test results are going to be favorable. And so it will be a more um, viable option within the next few years. Um, there has also been uh, an herbicide approved. Um, it is called Habitat Aqua. It is an amazapir based herbicide. Amazapir has been licensed for use in wetland areas in the US for about 20 years. It's commonly used for Phragmites and it is very effective. Um, Habitat Aqua is the wet version of the product Arsenal power line, which has been available in Canada for terrestrial use. But when you apply things in water, um, you have some different uh, requirements and different um, evaluations that are required by the Pest Management Regulatory Agency. So earlier this year, Habitat Aqua was approved for use on Phragmites in wetland areas. And this is kind of a game changer um, because we have in Ontario been without the use of an herbicide for ever um, for wetland areas. So um, consider this as another tool in the toolbox for Phragmites management in areas um, where you might wanna use an herbicide. Um, I recognize that a lot of people don't want to go that way. So I don't need to encourage people to do that if they don't want to. Um, currently, this product is only available for sale to licensed herbicide applicators, and it is um, extremely expensive. So um, I don't know that it will be readily available for use this fall, but it will certainly be an option in coming years. If you are going to enter into Phragmites management, a couple key tips are that management efforts are going to be long-term. I've heard Phragmites likened to dandelions in your lawn. For those who manage dandelions, you know that they come back every year. Phrag is incredibly persistent. And if you're going to launch a management effort, you need to be prepared to work annually for at least the next five years to continue to knock it back and assess it and monitor it. Also be aware that management, the act of management can impact other species. For Canadian Wildlife Service, we're particularly interested in making sure that our management doesn't impact species at risk. But you may have other plants that you want to protect. There are all sorts of wildlife species that you want to ensure are not impacted by management actions. So um, these are just things to keep in mind as you're working. And I do encourage, particularly in areas where FRAG is just starting to establish, to come up with a plan sooner rather than later. Because if you wait and allow FRAG to establish in much larger stands, the work will become very expensive and much more complicated to do.
I got a question about giving examples of how frag management can impact species of risk. And I will go into that in just a moment. Um, and maybe some of this slide will be a little bit telling. So two of the main best practices for Phragmites are use of herbicide and removal of standing dead biomass. This approach is by far the most effective long-term treatment for Phragmites. It's been used in the US for 40 years and it results typically in the, um, the kill of you know, around 97 to 99% of the Phragmites when it's done correctly. Um, this is something that we've just started doing in the Long Point region of Ontario, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, but the herbicide is applied during the fall when the plant is beginning to senesce and drawing all of its energy down into that dense root mat. Um, that kills the plant. Um, but what you're left with then is a standing dead six meter tall plant um, through which no new vegetation can grow. Um, and it's also really difficult to come back in the next year and find any new regrowth when you're dealing with that dense of a, of a situation. So what we have been doing is using a very large machine called a Marshmaster. Looks like a tank, but it's um, actually made out of aluminum, so it's very light and designed to work in wetland conditions. It actually floats. Um, we roll down that standing dead vegetation so that um, the stems are knocked down, new vegetation can grow through it, we, we get the light down to the ground, etc. Um, but to answer your question, um, when we use heavy equipment like that in a wetland area, in an area where we might have species such as um, frogs and toads and turtles, we need to be aware of the type of equipment that we're using and when we're using it so that we don't impact those species. A second tool or technique that's used commonly in Ontario is uh, selective cutting or cut to drown technique or spading. And some of these um, were really spearheaded by our Ontario family members, Lynn Short from Humber College and Janice Gilbert, uh, the um, Invasive Phragmites Control Center. And they've done a lot of work in the Georgian Bay area and along the coast of Lake Huron um, to cut Phragmites underground. And so in this image, you'll see Phragmites being cut underwater using a specialized um, piece of machinery called a truck saw. And it has like a, it's kind of like a boat with a cutting blade that cuts below the surface deep enough so that um, when, the, the, so that the plant really can't get oxygen. And uh, there are some pretty specific requirements. You can't just cut it right below the surface. Um, Janice Gilbert has just been doing a lot of work on the shoreline of Lake Huron um, with partners using this approach. Um, the second image here is uh, a technique called spading. And this has become very popular um, for invasions of Phragmites in uh, sandy shorelines in cottage country um, where a, a, a spade can be used to cut the plant below the surface. And, and again, there's some pretty specific techniques associated with this. It's not overly challenging, but it is very time consuming. And so um, it's, it is an option, particularly where you might have smaller stands or where you have a large community that is interested in doing um, a, a Phragmites management uh, treatment. There are, a couple of key uh, resources for best practices. Uh, one is the Guide to Control and Management of Invasive Phragmites, which came out of Michigan. Uh, again, this is mostly focused on the use of herbicides for Phragmites management, um, but it's really valuable because it gives um, guidance um, on 
Fragmite is management dependent on the type of scenario you have or, or your capacity. So if you have a large stand uh, or you have the ability to flood an area, um, it gives uh, examples based on that. The second is, uh, is of course, out of Toronto, um, Ontario, and this was just updated in 2020, and it's the best management practices in Ontario, published by the Ontario Invasive Plant Council. So this is also a really good resource for people. There are some other approaches, um, most of which are not, um, not that great yet. And some of them are okay, <laughs> but um, to go over a few of these, um, I hear of a lot of people doing um, cutting of seed heads, and this is um, somewhat valuable, um, but recognize that the plants also spread from the roots and rhizomes, and so this is not going to um, fully control the issue, um, but it, it does help. Um, there has been publicity surrounding the use of goats. Um, goats. Goats will eat anything, including Phragmites, but they also walk on everything. And um, they're very, it's, it seems neat, but um, it's, it's very intensive, very expensive. Um, I, I don't really recommend it. Um, mowing and burning when done alone will just um, just anger the Phragmites and will make it grow back stronger. Um, tarping is another technique that's been used. I believe the city of London used it. Um, again, it's just a very intensive practice where you have to apply very thick black plastic. Phragmites is very robust and can often poke through the fray, poke through the plastic. Um, you're going to end up killing any other vegetation that's under that area as well. So, um, so again, not not really one that I recommend. Uh, I biocontrol is coming, so um, I, I do hope that within the next uh, three to five years, that one is something that people can use. Um, um, just as we did with the Galaricella beetle for um, purple strife several years ago. So, um, now that I've talked a little bit about what Phragmites is and that it's possible to manage, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Long Point Walsingham Forest. So this is Ontario's priority place for conservation action. It includes the Long Point Peninsula, uh, which is where the, um, the Long Point biosphere is located. Um, and it also includes the upland or upper watershed areas associated with this. Um, this area has, a, has quite a pedigree. Um, it is a you know, Ramsar site of international importance. It is the biosphere reserve. It is... Um, uh, important bird areas. There are two national wildlife areas, uh, provincial park, conservation lands owned by the province, by um, Nature Conservancy, Birds Canada. Um, it's, it's just a really special area. Um, it is a sand spit that extends about 40 kilometers into Lake Erie. It's really dynamic, particularly as you get toward the end and uh, has been impacted significantly by high waters within the last couple of years. Um, within this area, there are more than 60 species at risk. And it's really important for migratory birds like waterfowl. Um, the issue is, and you'll see from the image on the right, it's estimated to contain between 1,500 and 2,000 hectares of Phragmites. So we are talking about a lot of very dense Phragmites. In the image on the right, you will see sort of a light green color. Um, that is all Phragmites. Um, to get back to my point earlier about getting on Phragmites before it has a chance to establish, 
Here is an image of the Big Creek unit, Big Creek National Wildlife Area in 2006, where we estimate there was about five hectares of Phragmites. In 2015, 11 years later, this had expanded to cover up to 176 hectares of Phragmites. So just a tremendous increase over 10 years and a spread of, um, I believe, 25% annually, just incredible. There are a lot of species at risk that are impacted by Phragmites and just a couple um, to highlight really important um, at Long Point and at other areas in Ontario, we have um, spotted and blanding's turtles, which are, um, which are species at risk and are tremendously impacted by Phragmites. The habitat has been degraded. Turtles that have to walk through very dense stands of Phragmites have to use up a lot more energy um, than they would in their more uh, native um, marsh meadow type habitats. Females are at risk of being stranded in dense patches and, and turtles have actually been found suspended in uh, dead turtles have been found suspended in Phragmites. Um, they also have reduced hatchling success um, in these areas. So Phrag is, has a big impact on our turtle species as well as bird species. And least bittern and king rail are particularly impacted. Phragmites decreases open water in wetlands. And as a result, there's decreased habitat, decreased productivity, uh, and decreased available of nesting sites for a lot of these sensitive species. So in 2015, a group of partners led by uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and Nature Conservancy Canada, they identified that we are kind of at a tipping point in the Long Point region. And Phragmites had expanded so much that these species uh, were really, um, these sensitive species were, were really at risk of just becoming um, in, in, totally imperiled and, and um, extirpated basically. So they requested the use of the herbicide Roundup, which is glyphosate-based herbicide, commonly used in upland areas, but not legal for use in wetland areas. However, glyphosate-based herbicides have been used effectively for the management of Phragmites in the U.S. Great Lakes for 40 years. And there's been a significant amount of research on the use of herbicides, the herbicide glyphosate. Um, however, at the same time, um, the herbicide glyphosate uh, was in the news a lot. And so um, the, the, the team that started this project had to ensure that there was a robust monitoring um, approach associated with this. And they did get special approval from the Pest Management Regulatory Agency to use the herbicide Roundup Custom just for Phragmites management and just within a specific area of Ontario, this imperiled area of Long Point and Rondo. And they also partnered with the University of Waterloo uh, to monitor the fate and effect of the herbicide and the ecological response of the herbicide. There were um, you know, a year of permits and regular regulatory requirements associated with this. And they did a lot of communication and engagement uh, before they were able to uh, begin treatment in 2016. The approach that they followed was um, a best management approach using the herbicide followed by cutting, rolling, or burning during the winter months. So the herbicide was applied by helicopter, um, which is a pretty unique um, application tool. The helicopter, uh, for reference, flies three meters above the, uh, the Phragmites. So 
very low. It flies very low and it flies very slow and only on appropriate weather days where wind is less than 16 kilometers per hour um, and the, it's sunny and there's, there are lots of conditions, but they treated by ground and by air, um, then followed up with cutting, rolling, and burning. The herbicide is only applied once per year, but it's recognized that we need to come back the following year and check to see um, whether a retreatment is necessary. It will always be necessary. And um, there's been a lot of post-treatment monitoring associated with that. Um, I've got a couple questions here. Goats poop would spread the seed. Can goats poop, poo goat poop spread the seeds? I actually think that goat poop does not spread the seeds of Phragmites, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, I think that's sort of one of the advantages of using goats, but I am not entirely sure of that. Another question is, are there particular areas that are more susceptible to Phragmites spread? Um, are areas with higher native plant biodiversity more resilient? Um, so I would say that areas with disturbance are going to be very sensitive, very prone to Phragmites establishment. So a lot of Phrag has spread from Southern Ontario through the use of road equipment, ditch maintenance equipment. You clean ditches in Southern Ontario, you catch a few stems of Phragmites along the way and you take it up to uh, Northern Ontario and those little tiny remnants are gonna re-sprout. And that's how um, a lot of Phrag has spread in roadside ditches. So those areas that are um, um, disturbed are great sites for Phrag to reestablish. Um, Clearly, we had a lot, we had great biodiversity at the two national wildlife areas, which are now completely dominated by Phragmites. So the presence of native, uh, of a uh, highly biodiverse native species may slow the establishment of Phragmites, but when you let it go for 10, 15 years, um, what we have seen is that <clears throat> Phrag will still take over. So from the province's uh, work, they found, <clears throat> they worked a lot with University of Waterloo and they found that this herbicide treatment followed by rolling or burning the Phragmites results in the kill of 97 to 99% of the Phragmites after one year. They also monitored what happens to the herbicide and the surfactant mixed with the herbicide and um, made sure and, and were, were clear that when it was applied to the plant, they monitored where it went after it was applied and it was always orders of magnitude below the ecological thresholds for concern. And this was really important because um, a lot of folks interested in um, use of glyphosate or really concerned about the use of glyphosate were worried that there would be a significant impact to aquatic life. Um, those of us who have used glyphosate for Phragmites in the US knew that this wasn't going to be the case, but it was good to get these results from the University of Waterloo. And a couple of those um, publications are noted here below. The province did find that after Phragmites had been managed, there was a secondary invasion of European frogbit um, that did come up one in two years after Phragmites management. Um, but after the, th the third year post-management, um, native species were beginning to recover and the frogbit um, was declining. We have found that habitat and species are recovering. <clears throat> Doug Tozer from Birds Canada has published a paper on the recovery of bird species post Phragmites management. We know that Fowler's toads are beginning to rebound and um, wetland vegetation, including um, <clears throat> bent spike rush is also recovering. Oops. Um, here's an image of scale. 
So this is what the province and Nature Conservancy managed between 2016 and 2020, all of the areas in red were managed. This is about 1,350 hectares. What is left is the, um, is the yellow or orange color, which basically delineates the boundaries of the national wildlife areas. There's a little bit on crown lands that were um, left as um, control and reference sites for monitoring that are planned to be treated this year. But it took a while for the Canadian Wildlife Service to jump on the frag management bandwagon. We want, wanted to be really sure that uh, we weren't going to be increasing any risk for species that were already of concern. And so with the research from the University of Waterloo and from the province, and with the, um, the support of a lot of partners within the biosphere, um, we have developed a um, integrated plan for conservation action in the, um, in the priority place. And one of our primary objectives is to manage Phragmites in order to restore habitat for species at risk and other wetland wildlife. And Canadian Wildlife Service has now initiated a five-year program uh, that will run through 2024 to manage about 90% of the Phragmites within the national wildlife areas. And this amounts to about 600 hectares. Uh, we will be using the same approach that has been used by the province and Nature Conservancy. Uh, we have continue to request the use of the herbicide Roundup Custom. Um, even though it is not registered, we have applied for an emergency registration um, application to be able to use that herbicide. And we have also initiated some um, robust ecological monitoring and adaptive management approaches. Uh, we are monitoring the fate and effects of the herbicide. Again, this is looking at uh, the concentrations of herbicide in water and sediment before and after herbicide treatment to figure out what those concentrations are to ensure that they're safely below the ecological thresholds for safety and um, and, and safe, safety especially for aquatic uh, aquatic life. We're also looking at the effect of the treatment on vegetation. So we're tracking before and after vegetation using satellite imagery. Uh, we're also looking at what comes back <clears throat> post-treatment. And so this um, image on the bottom is actually called, it's called a marsh organ, organ like a, like a church organ with different lengths of pipes um, to look at what sorts of species are, are coming back post-treatment. We're also looking at the effect of the treatment on wildlife, including birds, frogs, turtles, and fish. So um, I, I'm really proud that a management project like this is also going to contribute so much research knowledge for species at risk and for the national wildlife areas. Outputs and outcomes. So what is actually happening from this work? Um, this is an aerial photo that I took a couple of years ago. The image on the left has been treated for frag. And so what you'll see is green, which is cattail. You'll see um, brown, which is dead Phragmites, and you'll see lines. And lines are left over from the heavy equipment, the marsh master, that knocks down the standing dead vegetation. The image on the right shows where the cattail was left. This is, a, this is on the border between the Long Point Provincial Park on the left and the thoroughfare unit of Long Point National Wildlife Area on the right. And you'll see on Long Point, we still have a lot of that light green, which is Phragmites um, that we'll be managing. Um, so management is very effective. Um, we have heard from Dr. David Green at McGill University that they're reporting more Fowler's toads than he's seen in 30 years. 
um, which is really encouraging. And um, species such as uh, bent spike rush are starting to um, reestablish. Lessons learned. So I'm starting to wrap up here. Lessons learned. Every project has risk. Everything we do has risk. And what we need to do is be aware of it and try to minimize it. So for <clears throat> the national wildlife areas, we were concerned about any work that we would do that could negatively impact species at risk. And so we had to pick our timing windows for management to avoid areas um, when birds and other wildlife might be active. You should always pick a best management practice based on the scale of the issue and on your capacity to implement it. Um, so I would not recommend that you hire a helicopter to treat um, a couple of hectares of Phragmites. That's just not going to um, be worthwhile for you, obviously. Um, work with experts. No one should ever go it, alone, go it alone on Phragmites. There are lots of experts in the area and lots of people willing to give advice based on years and years of experience. So please work with experts and communicate with others. I also recommend that uh, before you initiate a project, you establish your objectives. So what, what do you wanna see? Is it the recovery of native plants? Is it the restoration of um, a shoreline so that you can have access to your lake and to your beach? Um, and then monitor that before and after so that you know what you're doing is having the desired outcome. Um, anecdotal information is really just not that helpful. Um, so have before and after and, and be prepared to change your approach if you're not having the, um, the desired outcome. And as always, uh, this is a, a long-term effort. So for Canadian Wildlife Service, we needed to conduct a risk assessment. We, we have a lot of species at risk. Um, we didn't, clearly did not want to work when birds might be nesting or rearing young. And um, frankly, the management of Phragmites is quite conducive for this. Um, the best time to apply herbicide is in September and October. And generally at that point, um, a lot of other plants have senesced, um, birds have migrated, um, some birds or some um, frogs and turtles are um, hibernating, et cetera. Um, but really, this is something that we really needed to be aware of. Um, choose best practices that minimize risk, work with contractors that know what they're doing. Um, incorporate buffer zones around species at risk where non-target uh, plants or animals um, stop work to avoid species at risk. This, this is something, this is a detail that we always go over with our contractors that if you see a species at risk, if you see a wildlife species in your area, <clears throat> you need to stop what you're doing, mark it, record it on a GPS and, um, move out of the way. Um, and of course, monitor and adapt everything that you're doing if you're not having the desired outcome. The best practice for you depends on scale, capacity, and objective. Um, if you're working in a newly established stand, um, it may be best to do some spading to cut off that plant um, underground. Alternatively, if you're in a wetland area that's very remote and hard to get to, um, you may consider use of an herbicide, uh, which can be applied with a backpack sprayer. Um, but again, these are all going to depend on uh, what your comfort level is with using those tools and um, the scale of the issue. Plan for long-term, I really can't emphasize that enough. Don't 
start a program unless you really are confident that you'll be able to continue it because Phragmites does have an incredible ability to rebound after it's been um, impacted one way or another. There are lots of experts. Here are a few names that, um, in addition to mine, uh, are folks that are great to talk with. Eric Cleland from the Nature Conservancy, who's um, in the process of developing a province-wide plan for Phragmites management. Uh, Janice Gilbert, who is using the cut to drown. She's just an incredible wealth of knowledge and just uh, incredibly hardworking. Uh, Lynn Short from Humber College spearheaded the, um, the spading method. Um, so she's a great resource and a lot of folks have worked with her to establish um, local community driven programs. And Francine McDonald at the MNRF is also a, an excellent resource. Heather, if I could just quickly jump in on that last slide yeah. there. Just wanted to also mention that um, Georgian Bay Forever had been leading a lot of the Fragmites work on, on Georgian Bay and Eastern Georgian Bay. And they partnered with Janice Gilbert and using that cut to ground protocol had been you know, working in a number of wetlands on our coast. So if you're interested in, um, as a community, tackling a Fragmites patch, I would direct you to the Georgian Bay Forever website. Awesome, thanks for adding that. There is a question on excavating a small patch um, in a wetland. <clears throat> I, um, I would not recommend excavation at all in any situation. When I, when I think of excavation, I'm thinking of someone going in with a, an excavator and digging out something, and I do not recommend that. Um, if you have a small patch and you can address it by targeted um, spading or targeted herbicide application. Um, those are those are potentially better approaches with excavation. Um, I think you're likely not going to get everything out and then you're just going to be transporting it somewhere else to become established. Um, this frag never dies. <laughs> You'll think it's dead, but it's not dead. Um, monitor and evaluate. Again, this is just a plug for making sure you think about what your objectives are, that you're monitoring to determine whether the work that you're doing is working. I wanted to put in a plug for the Phragmites Adaptive Management Framework, uh, which is run by the Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative, and um, they have a, a monitoring protocol established that is relatively easy for anyone to follow to help you monitor before your management and after your management um, to ensure that what you're doing is having desired outcomes. And here's the, a link for that work right here. So here's a question about uh, what if a species at risk is stuck underneath and you're clearing and you don't see them. So I presume this is like, what if um, you're driving a piece of equipment around and there's a turtle under the Phragmites and you don't see them. Um, and that's a great question. And for that reason, we choose to use our heavy equipment only at times when risk to those species is minimized. So we use marsh masters only in the, uh, the fall. We map to the extent possible where we think that there might be species at risk. Um, but of course, species move around, so it's um, impossible to track exactly where they are while we're driving around. The machine is very, very loud and it moves very slowly at one to five kilometers per hour. So for a lot of species, there's the ability to move out of the way. Um, the species that we anticipate we will have the greatest challenge with is turtles. And some turtle species um, 
when they hibernate um, are just below the surface of the Phragmites. And so for that reason, when we manage Phragmites to knock it down, we do so only in the winter before turtles come out um, to bask. So we do our best. We use, I call it heavy equipment, but um, <clears throat> it actually exerts less pressure per square inch than a human footprint does. So it kind of floats on top of the vegetation. It's not like it's driving on a, on a concrete ground or anything. Um, but again, we do our best if we ever see a SAR species or we know of SAR species, uh, we avoid them. And we also check all equipment and follow safe equipment protocols to be sure that um, while the equipment is resting, um, snakes or other species haven't crawled up inside. Um, so um, hopefully that answers that question. Um, is there funding available for invasive frag management, especially when SAR are involved? And the answer is yes. The Canadian Wildlife Service annually has funding available that is targeted for the recovery of habitat for species at risk. And so Phragmites management that um, results in the recovery of habitat for SAR um, there, there are funding sources available for that um, through the Canadian Wildlife Service. Also jump in, I think Heather is joining us from Beausoleil, so she would in particular be interested in AFSAR. And Heather, yeah. I'll shoot you an email for the AFSAR contact. Absolutely. Thanks, Dave. Um, all right. And that's all I have for today. I did want to recognize um, all of the partners who've been working with Canadian Wildlife Service for a number of years, um, and the broader frag management community, um, which, you know, compared to my experience in the U.S., um, communities and citizens are much more engaged in Phragmites management for the recovery of native species. And so, um, it's been a real pleasure for me to be able to work with, um, to be back in Canada again, and then to work with such a, a heavily invested and engaged community. So I appreciate everything that you're, you're doing and your, your continued interest in this work. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to, to take them now. Also, I wanted to quickly jump in as you guys might be adding some questions. Um, just tie it together a bit. So Heather has been presenting on Long Point, and there's some neat connections between Eastern Georgian Bay and Long Point. They're both biosphere reserves. Um, Long Point has also been a priority place, as um, Heather mentioned in her presentation. And you might not be aware that um, Eastern Georgian Bay has also been designated a community nominated priority place back in 2019. So the Georgian Bay biosphere, together with other Co-applicants, Georgian Bay Land Trust, Magnetowan First Nation, Shawanaga First Nation, and Wasoxing First Nation is also a key partner, have been working on uh, coastal species at risk conservation. And so this project has now been called um, Mamwe and Antikizarin, and that's a collaborative project. Um, and we chose that project title because it combines the words and meanings of together land renewal and life. And one of the key purposes of this project is to engage in cross-cultural learning and apply a two-eyed seeing approach to our work. Um, so that helps us to improve our understanding, respect, and relationships with each other um, and with the land as well. So I can put the link up here in the chat and we'll put it in the email later. Um, but one of the key parts of this that connects to Phragmites is that Georgian Bay Land Trust has been leading on a updated natural areas conservation plan. So that's updated species at risk habitat ma mapping, which also includes in Phragmites mapping. Um, so we're working together collaboratively to figure out where that Phragmites is, what areas we might prioritize, and how do we go about eradicating it. So if you're interested in that project, um, please get in touch. If you would like us to come to your community and present about that project, get in touch, we can do that.
Doesn't look like we're getting many other questions. Must have been a fantastic presentation, Ellie. <laughs> or something, yeah. I did include my email down at the bottom. So if, um, if you are interested in learning more, um, again, the, I focused heavily on Long Point because that's really been my focus. Um, but I do anticipate that over the coming years that will shift a little bit um, to look more at um, Phragmites Ontario wide. So um, please don't hesitate to reach out. Oh, we got a question there, Heather. So the question is for habitat restoration, are there any efforts needed past invasive species removal? Right, so great question. Um, and one that's sort of hotly debated. Um, what has been found is that in areas where there is a, uh, a robust native seed bank, it is not necessary to immediately go in and replant native plants. It is anticipated that if you manage the frag, um, you will have a recovery of the native vegetation. However, this is something that we um, think should be monitored um, in areas where we've had high water in, uh, on Lake Erie, the recovery of native veg has really been slowed. Um, if you have uh, an area that's not as influenced by the lake, you might get your native veg starting to come back one year after treatment. Ours took more like three years. Um, so do monitor that because if you're not getting the species recovery that you like, you might need to come in and do some planting. Uh, I think uh, we're also, the, the province is looking at um, establishing some wild rice in areas where um, it used to be um, present in the Rondo area, but is not present right now. So that's, um, that will be a really interesting uh, project to see how that works out. Any other questions? Just trying to see, if, I don't know if people have asked anything in the chat panel, David. Yeah, there's a couple there that just popped up in the chat panel. If you want to check them out, please. I could read it if that would help. Yeah, I'm actually not seeing my sure. chat on here right now. Heather says, I would like to take a road trip to actually see the results of management efforts. I guess GBB is closer to my location. Suggestions. Um, and I believe Heather's location is Bosaway. So... Um, you're, you're saying you're closer to Georgian Bay? Correct. Or Georgina. I can't remember which where Heather's from, but um, so, yeah. So I know that there have been a lot of shoreline restoration projects on the coast of um, Lake Huron um, near Tiny and just in that general area where um, the... Um, the truck or equipment has been used for the cut to drown technique. Um, and Janice Gilbert has just some incredible pictures where like there was a, a camp area that hadn't been accessible for canoeing for years and years until the, the frag was removed. And now campers are there using, um, using the area for canoe access um, again. Um, and all the way down to like Kincardine, there are uh, there are examples. If you ever did want to come out to Long Point, um, there's there's a, a ton of work. You can see some of the work right at Big Creek, which is easy to access. Um, uh, it's also easy to access the Long Point Provincial Park um, public land where there's been a lot of work done. Also been quite a bit of work done at Seven Sound. Yeah, yeah. And Michelle with Seven Sound Environmental Association is a good contact. Any other questions? 
There was a question about biocontrol risks regarding the European moth. Excellent. So um, the risk of using the moth, the risk of using any biocontrol agent are studied extensively before it's, before it's approved. And um, researchers at Cornell, the University of Toronto, um, and, and other institutions studied a suite of moths for 20 years um, before they were comfortable that they had found a species, actually there's a couple of species that would only target the invasive Phragmites and that would not impact species other than invasive Phragmites. And so this has been extensively studied. There is a, a very thorough um, review process that goes on in both the US and Canada. And it would not have been approved um, if the research had not been rigorous. And of course, the reason that there's such uh, uh, a critical review process is because of the accidental importations that have occurred um, and the devastation associated with those. So intentionally bringing across a species uh, means that we're paying very close attention to it. And so right now, the University of Toronto and Ag Canada are doing some test releases. Now, they, now that they know that there's a species, we know that it works in very small scale. And so now they're taking it out into the field and they're releasing, they're placing some of the eggs of that species on leaves of Phragmites, the, the species bores in to the stem and it weakens the plant. So it's not eating the Phragmites per se, it's, it's weakening it. Um, it's very encouraging, but it's not going to be a silver bullet. It will just be another tool in the toolbox. Um, look, it looks like there's some good chat going on. Just, um, I really encourage people to talk to each other um, and share information because there's, um, there's no sense recreating the wheel on Phragmites management. Um, we can all learn from each other on it. Excellent to hear from Elizabeth about your work in Huntsville. That's great. Yeah, everyone, we just need to keep um, chipping away at Phragmites and just be consistent and as tenacious as the plant itself. Um, where another question is where um, work has been done. Are there signs educating the public on the program? This is a great question because um, historically when we have done work at Long Point, we have placed signage um, to alert visitors that there is going to be management of Phragmites using an herbicide and, and why we're using an herbicide. Um, um, but what we found is that, well, then there are questions when we go in in the winter and we're rolling the herbicide and people are confused about why there's a machine that looks like a tank in the wetlands. And so what we've decided to do this year is to provide more comprehensive signage about what we're doing, when we're doing and why. And ultimately we will have um, sort of before after signage that really highlights um, the results of the work. But um, yeah, really important. Uh, we have a, a website through the Long Point Action Alliance um, on which we provide information on our, our program. Our, again, we're, we're a team with Canadian Wildlife Service, Nature Conservancy, um, Ontario Parks, MNRF, and we will provide information on that website, um, including daily updates of what we're actually, or when we're actually treating and what we're doing, um, just as a way to help keep the local community 
informed. Awesome. Heather, I I'm left not... the one question up in the Q and A because I oh, was busy with the chat and didn't notice if you answered it or not. Yeah. So for a species at risk in this area, is there one particular species that you could monitor that would give you an idea of habitat recovery? Okay. So you're looking for some sort of keystone species um, that would be used as a proxy for others. Um, great question. So I know for Canadian Wildlife Service, we're looking at um, Blanding's turtles um, as a proxy for other turtle species. Um, but for the Georgian Bay Area, I'm not sure specifically what um, what species you might target as that proxy. I don't know, David, if you or anyone else on the chat has some ideas. Yeah, we have Blanding's in this area. That would be one. I know you mentioned before that there was some um, birding work that was also done. So uh, at least bitterns an option as well, because they're really sensitive to Phragmites and uh, rely on those cattail wetlands. Um, spotted turtle might be another one. Fortunately, through the uh, Mamwe and Jikiza win, we've been able to install more MODIS towers. So if anyone oh. listening wants to come do some bird research on that, we have a network that'll help you do that. Yeah, and the marsh monitoring program is also a great tool for your sort of long term monitoring and looking at before and after. Um, so that's that's um, Birds Canada is a great resource for that as well. All right, I think we might be signing off now. Thanks for coming, everybody. Yeah, thanks, everyone. And um, if you do have follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to drop me an email. Um, and thank you, David, for having me join today. Welcome. Thanks for coming.